Hello there, and welcome to another episode of The Most Popular Thing in the World is Bad Actually, where I, or really any YouTuber who knows how to use Handbrake, gets easy internet points by criticizing the MCU. And look, the thing with the MCU is that it will always be really easy to criticize. When you homogenize the art of filmmaking to the point where you're able to pump out four movies a year plus a handful of TV shows, it will always be possible for someone like me to ask, was this style the best choice for this story? No matter what story you're making. Because of course, there's going to be times when different choices would be more suitable to the material at hand. The cinematography and color grading of a spy movie shouldn't be the same as what you use in a space epic. Of course, each individual movie could be better, but they couldn't make this number of passably good movies if they didn't have some kind of house style. I guess the MCU is good at telling simple, fun stories about quippy, relatable heroes and creating the desire to see those characters in future movies. It's not interested in anything else. However, I think a lot of the recent Marvel movies are doing something that does interfere with that main goal of getting audiences interested in new characters. Marvel has started making movies that kind of yada yada through their own first acts. After my mom died, my dad started my training. Let's take a look at the first half hour-ish of Shang-Chi. In a prologue, we meet Shang-Chi's father, Wen Wu, who is an ancient immortal warlord in possession of the magical Ten Rings. Searching for an ancient city, he meets its protector, Ying Li. They fall in love and have a child, Shang-Chi. Fast forward to the present day, and Shang is now Sean, an unambitious valet in San Francisco. His best friend is Katie, and she likes driving really fast. Please, get it. I'm, I'll go slow. <laughs> Scene two, at a bar, Sean and Katie tell the story of how they first met, which we don't get to see. And right before he's about to throw the first punch, Katie comes out of nowhere, steps right between us and starts screaming the lyrics to Hotel California. Their more successful friend points out that they aren't making the best of their talents. Maybe there's a point where you're supposed to stop going on joy rides and start thinking about living up to your potential. This establishes a core theme of the movie and the lesson of both of their character arcs. Both of them have to learn how to become more responsible people and use their talents to help others. But in the moment, they shrug off her advice and go partying. Scene three, Sean goes to Katie's place and has breakfast with her family where he's accused of being a mooch. The foundations of the film's other major theme about how you relate to your family's history in the past is laid here with Katie's grandmother still mourning her husband. We just know why Gong would have wanted you to move on and enjoy your life. Moving on is an American idea. Scene four has the inciting incident where they are attacked by ninjas on the bus. This scene absolutely rules. No notes. <laughs> And at the end of it, he realizes the ninjas have something to do with his sister. Therefore, scene five, Sean makes the decision to try and help his sister. Katie also makes a decision to help him. This is the end of act one. So on the surface, there's nothing terribly wrong with that structure. We meet our protagonists. We learned what their major character flaw is. The direction of the character arcs has been set up. The themes have been established. We have an inciting incident and the main characters make an important decision to engage with the problem. It's a pretty standard first act. The problem for me is that this isn't actually the first act of Shang-Chi's story. There's a whole series of flashbacks detailing his background and how his father trained him to be an assassin. Let's break them down. Flashback one, we learned that after his mother died, his father started training him as an assassin. His sister trained in secret. When they were 14, his father sent him on his first mission. The montage actually contains all of the other flashbacks within it chronologically. Flashback two, right before he goes on his first mission, he has a conversation with his younger sister where they are mourning their mother's death. She asks him not to leave her and he promises that he'll be back in three days, something we know doesn't happen. Flashback three, his father interrupts his training and tells him he needs to train both his body and mind in order to inherit the Ten Rings, showing us that Shang-Chi did at one point want to inherit them and make his father proud more than anything else. Flashback 4. Wen Wu tells us about how Ying Li had an effect on him, and we see them falling in love and beginning a family. Shang-Chi's mother is killed by his father's old enemies. He then witnesses his father take revenge and is tasked by his father to kill the man most responsible. Right after this, Shang-Chi confides in Katie that he did actually kill that man, and then didn't return to his father because he felt guilty. Notably, this scene is not shown as a flashback only talked about, in contrast to the rest of the backstory. Now, if we rearrange these scenes chronologically, including the prologue with his parents and adding the scenes that are talked about but not shown, we could instead have a first act and change that looks 
something like this. Wen Wu is an ancient warlord. He gives that up when he falls in love. For a time, the family lives happily, but then some mobsters kill his wife. Shang-Chi witnesses his father violently take revenge for the death of his mother. His father trains him to be an assassin, and Shang-Chi aspires to inherit the Ten Rings himself. While Wen Wu trains Shang-Chi, his sister practices in secret. His sister begs him not to leave her alone and promise that he'll return in three days. Shang-Chi is sent on his first mission. On the first mission, Shang-Chi kills the man responsible for his mother's death. That would be the end of the first act in a chronological version of the story. First acts typically end when the main character makes a significant choice, and this would be that. After this, the rest of the film could proceed as before. I think if you tell the story chronologically, you get more immediate reasons to care about Shang-Chi. You see right up front the effect the death of his mother has on him and the rest of the family. You see what his relationship is like with his sister, which emotionally invests the audience in finding her later on. And you can see the beginning of his relationship with Katie, though the dynamic of that relationship does already work and is one of the stronger parts of the story. Most importantly though, we're centering the idea of Shang-Chi having to wrestle with the good and bad parts of his heritage, rather than the story of him just being unambitious. And I think the former is where the story and character are stronger. It also means showing the most critical scene of his character development, which the film only alludes to. The fact that Chang chi was in fact an assassin who did in fact actually kill someone. This is the biggest hole in the story for me. We miss out on actually seeing this crucial moment of change in Shang chi and how that weighs on him over the rest of the story. His guilt over this moment is established and resolved in the same scene in the current film, rather than being explored over the course of the film. There's very little about the earlier parts of the movie that make it feel like Shang-Chi was actually an assassin and grappling with guilt. I just don't buy that that's who he is. He reads as too normal and too well-adjusted for that to be the case. When I think of his character arc, I think this is the story of an average guy from San Fran who becomes a level 20 monk, rather than this is the story of someone who trained to kill from a young age, learning to use his skills for the better. The movie wants to be both things, but I only know the second one because this scene is here to tell me that piece of information, not because I actually feel it on an emotional level. Giving the audience a piece of information is not the same as dramatizing a story. Also, I don't think this arrangement and extension of the story would add too much to the runtime because, well, there's a lot you could cut from this movie. The final battle with the big monster is completely unnecessary when the actual emotional conclusion to the story is Shang-Chi defeating his father. Trevor Slattery doesn't need to be here. And so much of the second act is the characters running from place to place, which could easily be pared down. What I'm trying to get at is the difference between character-focused storytelling and plot-focused storytelling. Character-focused story follows the character's emotional journey, the decisions they make, and how that changes who they are. A plot-focused story pushes the character from location to location to justify action scenes. In short, while the first act of Shang-Chi isn't bad by any means, I think it's the wrong first act if the goal is to build an audience's investment in his character. Captain Marvel has a similar problem. Now, in fairness, this movie has a better justification for its flashback structure than Shang-Chi does. The fact that Shang-Chi grew up as an assassin is not a mystery in that movie, whereas Captain Marvel's history as an Air Force pilot on Earth is. For most of the film, she suffers from amnesia and is slowly putting together her memories of her life on Earth before she became an intergalactic space cop. These memories are delivered to the audience mostly in fragments, quick snippets of scenes, and they're not really fleshed out. Only the memory that shows us how she lost her memories qualifies as a full scene. The rest is kind of in a hazy fog. The audience receives the information that Carol was a pilot, that she experienced sexism throughout her life, and that she succeeded despite this. But these scenes are so short that they don't tell the full story. They are not dramatized, only hinted at. All of those valuable empathy building classic first act scenes are skipped through. Now at this point, we could do the same thing we did with Shang-Chi and reorder the events chronologically, but I think that would also mean removing the amnesia plot point. But that rewrite is far more radical than just rearranging Shang-Chi. And also thematically, I think the amnesia idea is important to this film's idea of power structures telling you who you are and what your limitations are, and I wouldn't want to mess with that. Not every character needs to have their entire history chronologically laid out before they get to do the superhero stuff. When I first watched this movie, I actually loved that it started with her being a superhero without having to do a full, typical origin story for her. I don't need to see them as a kid to empathize with them, that's not what I'm saying, but if we're going to hint at important scenes from her childhood, 
that have informed her character and then try to cash in on those scenes emotionally at the climax, then the audience should get to experience those scenes in full so that they can resonate with them at the end. Because otherwise, the end is just going to feel hollow. And that's the thing. A first act problem isn't really a first act problem, it's a third act problem. Let's explain that more with another movie, Black Widow. This movie has one of the most perplexing climactic scenes in a blockbuster film in recent memory. There is so much going on in this scene that is only being established during the scene that needed to be established beforehand. Okay, here's the context. So you've got this family of super spies, mom, dad, Black Widow and her sister. Mom works for the bad guy who is going to capture them all. So with some face changing technology, Black Widow disguises herself as her mom so that she can infiltrate Drakov's base. Drakov is the head of the secret organization that brutally trained Natalie to be an assassin, a group she later defected from. Nat thought she killed him and his daughter back then and has felt guilty about the collateral damage of that. But of course, he's prepared for this, saying that, When you look into the eyes of a child you have raised, no mask in the world can hide that. Interspersed with this are brief flashbacks explaining what Black Widow's plan was, which is fine. It's a spy genre staple to get your characters in trouble and then reveal that they actually plan things out. It's fine. But then there's more. Drakov reveals that the masked soldier that Nat's been fighting this whole time is actually his own daughter who Nat thought she killed. Wow. What a reveal. Wish I knew who that character was beforehand. But whatever, he tells her to leave, so it doesn't matter anymore to the scene. So Nat tries to kill him, but can't because of pheromones. How are you controlling me? I'm not controlling you, Natasha. Well, not yet. But there is a pheromonal lock. Smelling my pheromones it prevents you from committing violence against me. Oh, but wait, there's more. She knew about the pheromones, and her mom told her how to combat them. You just gotta bang your head on a table a couple of times. It kind of feels like this guy would be prepared for that. But all of this is actually a ploy to get him to reveal his entire evil plan, which he does. But the pheromone thing ultimately doesn't matter because Nat fails to kill him. And Yelena, her sister, just kills him later without having to overcome the pheromones. So the only reason it's here as a plot point is to justify the two characters talking for a whole long while. The only reason they need to talk for a whole long while is because there are so many plot points this scene needs to touch on that weren't established earlier. In this one scene, we're covering Nat and Drakov's relationship. We've got to retell the audience that Drakov basically raised Nat to the point that he can see through her face disguising technology. Two, we've got to go over Nat and her mom's plan. Three, we've got the Taskmaster reveal. Four, we've got the Pheromones reveal. And five, we got the whole evil plan explanation. Now, other than Nat and Melina's plan, all of these plot points are ideas that could have conceivably been handled in the first act of this film. The real problem here is that this is the first scene in the movie where Scarlett Johansson and Drakov get to actually talk with one another. Okay, let's do a quick recap. The movie opens with a very effective scene. Natalie is living a good life with a good family in Ohio, but they are all actually Russian spies, and her father, having completed his mission, needs to escape. They do, and fly off to Cuba. In Cuba, we get the one establishing scene with Drakov where he has Nat's family broken up. The title card hits, and then so much happens. Like, more happens in the title card sequence for this movie than happens in the entire rest of the film. You've got this extremely frenetic and confusing sequence that I can't help but feel left most viewers scratching their heads. It whips through Natalie's training as a Black Widow, as well as Drakov's rise in political influence, but intercuts so much imagery that is, well, it's just a mess. So my question is... Why isn't what happens in the credit sequence part of the actual movie? If she's going to face off against Drakov at the end, why not show scenes where she is being trained as a Black Widow? A sequence that could have shown us the abuse she endured under Drakov and got us emotionally invested in his ultimate defeat. If we want to end this movie with Natalie feeling guilty about hurting Drakov's daughter, why not have scenes at the beginning that showed what her relationship was like with Drakov's daughter? If Drakov has a special smell that stops people from attacking him in Act 3, why not have a scene where someone tries to attack him but fails because of the smell tech in Act 1? That way you don't have to do the whole explanation while it's happening. The movie repeatedly tries to tell us that Drakov is 
really important and that Natalie has a long-standing grudge against him. But emotionally, it all falls flat because we didn't see it. In their one major scene together, both of them have to keep saying things to re-establish their basic relationship. When you look into the eyes of a child you have raised, no mask in the world can hide that. You took my choices and tried to break me. But you're never gonna do that to anybody ever again. I feel like these lines exist because the film knows it did not succeed in investing the audience in Natalie defeating Dracov, or even what their basic dynamic was. So it has to keep reminding us in the moment to justify what's happening. This is not how you want the climactic scene between your protagonist and your antagonist to go. When you have a scene like this where the two finally face off, that's the time you want the characters to be able to focus on what's really at stake in the movie. The theme. You want to see a clash of ideas. You want the audience salivating for the hero to win. Slick little flashbacks showing that the hero actually has a plan when we thought they were the ones being surprised are fine, but grinding everything to a halt to deliver exposition on almost every major plot point in the film is really not. For better examples of this, you need only look at the other movies I've mentioned in this video. Because even though I think those movies can also be improved, at least you know how to feel by the end when the hero and the villain are fighting at the climax. Now, I think part of the reason that we don't see some of these scenes is because this movie has to pull off a ridiculous juggling act in order to keep the continuity of itself straight within the MCU. A problem so complicated I'm not even going to attempt to unspool it. But the other reason we don't see, for instance, any of Nat's early life as a Black Widow is because that would involve showing tough scenes that include things like human trafficking, torture, mutilation. And this is a movie made by the Disney Corporation. I get why, for real world practical reasons, this movie can't be that, that it can't focus on those things for longer than an introductory credit sequence. But, you know, I didn't choose the subject matter for the story, they did. And they chose to avert the camera away from the nastier parts of the story that they were telling, which created all sorts of screenwriting problems for them in the third act. I think it's a similar reason why we don't see Shang-Chi actually kill someone in his movie. Disney wants to make safe, family-friendly movies, and they are not going to show their characters doing bad things to that degree because they need to sell action figures and maintain their brand reputation. But I think these were mistakes, or at least missed opportunities from a storytelling perspective. All of this is quite a shame, because Solid Act 1s used to be the MCU's bread and butter. I would argue that a ton of the MCU's initial success is because the early movies had solid first acts. Iron Man, Captain America, heck, even the Thor movie had well-structured introductions to their characters that showed what kind of person they were, what their flaws were, what their strengths were, what they wanted out of life, who was important to them, all while involving them in the main plot that needs solving. Imagine if in Iron Man we just watched him being Iron Man and then a flashback at the end told us he got captured by the Ten Rings and had to escape from a cave. You know, none of those movies held information back just so they could have a reveal later. They are upfront with who their characters are, and I think that makes a better foundation for the rest of their stories. And in fairness, Marvel's TV shows are getting this right. In Hawkeye, we got a seven minute introductory sequence to Echo, who is a secondary character on that show. But I know more about her and connect more to her as a result of those seven minutes than I do to any of the characters mentioned here. These movies have run times pushing two and a half hours. They definitely have the time for more patiently paced character introductions. People People often come to these kinds of movies for the big action set pieces in Act 3, but all of that is meaningless sizzle if you can't make the audience care in Act 1. So while making this video, it occurred to me that a lot of these criticisms could apply to The Book of Boba Fett, which just came out, and that actually I have a bunch to say about that show in general, which anyone who follows me on Twitter would probably know. So I put all of those miscellaneous thoughts into another video, and if you want to watch that one, you can do so on Nebula. Nebula is a streaming service I'm making with a bunch of other creators you've probably heard of where we can make videos that for whatever reason, wouldn't really work on YouTube. And you can find all of my regular videos there as well. And right now, if you use my link to get Nebula, you'll also be getting CuriosityStream for free. CuriosityStream is an excellent streaming service with thousands of documentaries to choose from. They've got a ton of science-focused and history documentaries, but they've also got documentaries for creative people as well, like this one on Roald Dahl, which you might enjoy if you've seen my video on Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Right now, that deal is also 26% off, which means you can get both services for an entire year for under $15, which in my opinion is pretty incredible value. So if you want to watch my other video and get all of that other content, then click on my link and sign up for Nebula and CuriosityStream.
Thanks for watching, everyone. And as always, a big thank you to my patrons for supporting me on Patreon. Keep writing, everyone.